little bit about my own background, um, where I've come from, from a research perspective, uh, as I'm new to the both the department and the group, uh, and then talk a little bit about how the work I have been doing is feeding into the ACON project. And I'd like to finish with a discussion, uh, tapping in a little bit to the expertise in, in the room, um, particularly the expertise in construction, because that's very much not my background. And I think there'll be some really interesting uh, insights and things to learn um, about how we can best apply the approaches I'm going to introduce to you today to construction as an industry. So uh, I worked in industry. I was working in manufacturing uh, operational improvement uh, and that took me to a, a very wide range of industries, everything from sort of mining to cheese making um, and around a certain amount of the world, uh, Canada, Texas, Wisconsin, uh, a bit of time in France, uh, as well as the UK. Um, but what struck me across all of those industries and all of those countries was that this continuous improvement type approach was time and time again, finding significant improvements in processes that had been running for a long time, that were run by experts in their field. Uh, and it was finding improvements in things like cost, labor productivity, even throughput in industries that were throughput constrained. Every additional unit they could make, they could sell. And that's why they'd called in improvement specialists. And it got me thinking, what would happen if we applied those same techniques to environmental impact, where there hasn't been this cost pressure to improve? Might the opportunity to improve existing processes rather than having to invest in new plants or even new technologies, might that be even bigger? And to get an answer to that question, I had to go back into research. And so that's what led me to my, uh, my PhD. Um, and what I began to realize was that as you visit different factories and you talk to them about waste, um, it's not particularly well defined, but the most common definition is probably what you end up putting in the bin. And if that bin happens to be a recycling bin, often it doesn't count as waste, even though the recycling process can often be truly downcycling, downgrading materials and losing a lot of uh, value and wasting a lot of embodied energy and carbon along the way. Uh, and it's harder still when you're looking at wasted heat or energy, um, mainly because it's very difficult, particularly from a frontline operational perspective, to sort of tease out what of the energy that you're using is waste and what is the natural or expected losses from a process. And in particular, if you're a factory manager or even a frontline factory worker, your job is to keep the factory running to keep your line running and to keep product coming out of the door. And if you make changes to that in order to save material or save energy and you're successful, then very often the best you can hope for as a reward for that is, is a bit of a pat on the head at best. If on the other hand, you're not successful and the changes you make lead to a disruption or a stoppage in production, perhaps missing an order, then you're very likely to lose your job. And that perhaps gave me a little bit more understanding as to why these opportunities exist. Um, not because people are not working hard or are stupid in some way, it's that we haven't set up our incentives right in factories to help people find ways to improve their processes, not just keep them running on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so that's where continuous improvement comes in. Um, and you've probably heard about various uh, continuous improvement methods, um, Six Sigma is one of the famous ones, but perhaps the most famous is Lean. Uh, and one of the things that Lean did was to try and redefine what we mean by waste. And they used the, the Tim Wood ac acronym, the in English at least, the seven types of MUDA, um, to try and help people see the different forms of waste that go on in a factory. However, this, when you, particularly when you try to apply it to um, sustainability metrics or in energy or carbon, you do run into problems. Uh, the example I've given is, is taken from uh, a factory tour that we did with some students um, from the Judge Business School in the UK. Uh, and this was a car factory that had a very strong lean program and they had cut down to the bare bones their rivet gun inventory because inventory is a form of waste according to lean. 
But the result of that was that every five minutes you had forklifts fran frantically zipping around this factory, resupplying the various rivet guns. And surely that's an example of unnecessary transportation. You're sending a person and a forklift over to carry maybe 10, 15 minutes worth of supply to different parts of the factory. And this to me really sums up one of the, the key problems with lean is that these different forms of waste often have trade-offs, particularly when it comes to something like um, embodied energy or, or indeed uh, energy use itself. So there are other forms of continuous improvement. Um, and this is the one that I have the most experience of. Um, and it was the one that uh, I specialized in when I worked in industry. Um, and this is called zero loss manufacturing. So it's not a, a new idea. Um, it's been around since, as far as I can tell, the late 1990s. It's not been highly studied, but there have been a number of successful companies that have made a living out of implementing it in industry. Um, and the, the key principle of zero loss, the, where it gets its name from, is that you compare your actual performance to some sort of theoretical first prin principles minimum. So you're not benchmarking, you're not looking at the um, existing process, you're not trying to sort of walk down the line and see where you think you see waste, at least not to start with. What you're doing is you're using physics or maths or um, sort of a simplified model of the process to try and understand, well, what's, you know, what are the real physical limits to this? What's the best we could do in a perfect world? And this does run into opposition often because, uh, people who are asked to implement this method do fear the idea that they're being asked to set themselves an impossible target. You know, if, if people feel like you're asking them to reach perfection, then uh, they find that very daunting indeed. But that's not quite what zero loss is trying to do. What it's really saying is the only fair comparison for each area of your performance, if each of these trade-offs, is to compare yourself to a theoretical maximum because that removes all subjectivity, all assumptions, all constraints, and puts a value on each of them. And then you apply your problem solving resource or your sort of micro targeted investment to the areas with the biggest improvement opportunity. And so what I wanted to do um, when I came back to research was find ways of applying these principles to sustainability. And that led to the development of what we call uh, the Zero Loss Sustainability Toolkit. Now, I'll present this to you um, to explain the tools as a sort of the toolkit spontaneously came into existence and then we used it and applied it to a load of factories. That's a complete lie. The way that it really worked was we did projects in factories and we teased out what worked and what didn't, and then we developed that into a toolkit. Uh, however, that makes a much more complicated and less clear narrative and so I'm going to explain the toolkit to you and then illustrate it with some of the examples of where we've applied this in industry. So the Zero Loss Sustainability Toolkit refocuses this improvement approach on your environmental impact, particularly on your energy consumption, so electrical energy, your fuel consumption, um, your CO2 emissions, uh, either direct from fuel combustion or from a process or indirect uh, from something like electricity, um, and your material efficiency as well. And what it's trying to do is use this continuous improvement CI approach to prioritize which uh, solutions are going to give you the biggest return on sustainability, but look for things that have a cost co-benefit. So you're not asking companies, at least not in the first place, to increase their operating cost in order to improve their sustainability performance, which is often what companies think they have to do. You're looking for things that can save both cost and carbon. And it's not technology focused. We're not looking to replace uh, installations with brand new plants or rely on new technologies like carbon capture and storage. We're trying to see what can we do today with existing factories, what's within their current performance envelope, or what might be the one thing that we want to invest in and want to change in order to get a measurable and predictable improvement in performance. And that, perhaps to those of you who, who have spent less time in industry, seems like a fairly straightforward and, and obvious way to go about things. But what 
one often finds uh, when factories are trying to make investment is that they will make an investment, they will make, make a business case for something, and then more often than not end up surprised by the performance that they get out of it. So I remember one factory that was trying to solve a um, alignment problem, in one of its machines, and they ordered a 20,000 uh, pound roller from China, uh, which therefore took months to get there. And they installed it in the machine and not only did it not solve the um, alignment problem, but it actually damaged the roller within about five minutes of installing it. So industry often has a capital first solution second mentality and zero loss as a entire philosophy tries to prioritize um, the opposite to that, which is looking for the things that are going to bring the biggest return on investment. So um, the zero loss toolkit breaks down into three main tools. Um, the first of these is what we call zero loss variance analysis. Um, and CI continuous improvement tools tend to be most successful when they derive from a simple intuitive principle. The tool itself can get quite complicated. You can have a method that leads you through a number of steps and, and be quite technical. But if you don't have an intuitive principle behind it, you will really struggle to get buy-in from the people who are working on the front line of the factory who are going to have to change the way that they do their job on a day-to-day -day basis in order to capture any of the benefit of using your tool. And if people don't see the value in what you're doing intuitively, then you will struggle to make that change. And so the simple intuitive principle that zero loss variance analysis starts from is that we're going to look at our average performance and then we're going to look at our best 10% of days. And that's not chosen for a particularly scientific reason. It's also not, a, not yet a zero loss threshold. It's just what are we doing one day a week, one day a fortnight, and why can't we do that all the time? And so the first pass is just to value the amount of improvement you would get if your um, factory was operating at its 10% or 10th percentile level of performance all the time. And if that's worth a lot in terms of cost or carbon, then it's worth the effort to dig down into the tool, understand what the um, variables are that are causing that shift in performance, which are controllable, what we can do about them. And then finally, to recombine those to try and make some sort of, to understand the process well enough that you can make a prediction as to what is the best possible performance that this uh, plant or this process could operate at. And that's where the zero loss part comes in. That's how you build up that theoretical maximum. And so this was developed from and applied to the cement industry. Um, and we ended up looking at the cement industry, uh, as I'm sure many of you are fully aware, working in construction, very large proportion of uh, industrial CO2 emissions, indeed of, of global CO2 emissions, somewhere between five and 8%. Uh, about 50% of the CO2 emissions come from the chemistry of the process, driving off the carbon dioxide from limestone. 40% come from the fuel being burned in that process, and about five and five from the electricity used and the transportation. And so we focused in on the fuel derived emissions. And what we found was that there was a 16% difference on a day-to-day -day basis, so the S-curve the there, each dot is a day's worth of data. There was a 16% difference between your average performance and your best 10% of days. And so that was a lot. That really kind of you know, uh, opened some eyes in the industry and, and, and got them a lot more bought into working with us to find out why this was. Um, and so then we dug down, we were building you know, uh, control volume models and then predictive models. Uh, but what we found was, in short, if we were able to control the um, the excess air in this combustion process better, um, to have a better handle on the fuel chemistry, because the cement industry has transitioned quite organically from an industry that burned coal to an industry that is a co-producer of cement and disposer of waste, uh, a lot of domestic waste, industrial waste like solvents, tyres, etc. If you've got a better handle on that, uh, that fuel chemistry and you're burning it in the right places in the process in order to get the most out of it, then you would deliver between a 15 to 20 percent reduction in your fuel derived carbon dioxide emissions, equivalent to a sort of six to eight 
percentage improvement in the total CO2 from the process. Now you do that on a global scale, and it's the equivalent of reducing global CO2 emissions by sort of order of magnitude half a point, half a percentage point. We're planning on spending about a trillion pounds decarbonizing the entire UK economy in order to have roughly the same effect. That gives you an idea of the scale and potential of the improvement that's available within uh, major industries within the existing envelope of the performance. We're not asking this plant to do any better than it's already doing 10% of the time, one day in 10. So that's um, an application of zero loss variance analysis. Another tool, um, and again, you'll see we're sort of uh, moving downstream um, from cement manufacture, and we will, we will get to the relevance of these tools to construction. That's kind of what I want to end this talk with. Uh, but the next tool is what we call zero loss power matching. And this is trying to take advantage of the fact that as we um, decarbonize our electricity grid, we become more and more reliant on non-dispatchable power. In other words, power that we can't control when it is generating or not. So traditionally, you would have base load power and then you would have dispatchable power, something like hydroelectric or more commonly gas turbine power that kicks in when demand is there. When you've got a lot of renewables and when you get to about 30% renewables, which we are rapidly approaching, you stop being able to guarantee that you can sell every megawatt hour generated by renewable power. And that could have real knock-on implications for the economic viability of renewables, which is just starting to become cost competitive with other forms of generation without the need for, for major subsidies. And so there's an opportunity to flex industry production to match that generation rather than the traditional way of flexing generation to match demand. And so this tool is a way of trying to work out how much flexibility there is in a process to take advantage of that without necessarily compromising on production. So you apply bottleneck theory to manufacturing, you work out which of the units that actually control your throughput through your factory, and then see what you can adjust around that in order to take advantage of low cost and low carbon power. Um, and so the tool gives you an estimate of the value of this, and then a and if that estimate is worth it, if it is valuable enough to actually change your production process, then it gives you a method to determine how you might take advantage of that power better. Uh, and so we did this uh, again in the cement industry, um, but this time looking at the um, electrical energy, which in cement is mainly used by the stone grinding. Uh, so crushing stone right down into the raw meal that goes into the kiln, and then taking the clinker that comes out of the kiln and grinding it down into cement. And what we found was actually that the capacity of these processes was about twice the capacity of the kiln, which made the kiln the bottleneck. So as long as we could keep that kiln fed 24 hours a day, we could, within that constraint, flex the production around it to take advantage of low carbon and low cost power. Uh, and we found that uh, with it, with, within the existing um, envelope of the, of, the, of the cement plant, we could reduce our electricity costs by about 4% and our carbon by 2% or vice versa, depending on whether you optimized for cost or optimized for carbon. Um, now th those numbers are relatively small at first glance, but there's a few things that actually make it a little bit more significant than that. Firstly, of course, this is um, with the existing electricity mix. So this opportunity is only gonna grow as, and. Uh, will need to be taken advantage of as we decarbonize. Secondly, even with that existing mix, the power companies, the way they are set up at the moment financially, is they only pass on half the cost of volatility or volatility of cost onto their consumers. So actually, if they passed on the full volatility, which they could do at the stroke of a pen, that um, margin doubles to 8% of cost. Now, in the cement industry where fuel is one of your, or energy is one of your biggest costs and electrical energy is half of your fuel cost, in such a low bar margin business as cement, that's huge. 
and it can make the difference between a cement plant being economically viable and not. And finally, as we go into the future, this is going to be the kind of approach that we're going to need to take if factories want to have their own on-site renewable generation. So rather than feeding back into the grid, they can design their production around um, being able to make it most of renewable energy. And that is what they're going to have to do if they are going to have truly zero carbon production facilities. And now that is going to cause some ructions because it actually goes against some of the established manufacturing theory like lean that says you want a very balanced production line. You don't want flexibility. Uh, and so that is actually going to take a little bit of uh, rethinking in terms of how we design the factories of the future. The final tool in the zero loss toolkit is the one that's probably most relevant to the construction industry itself. Uh, and this is what we call zero loss yield analysis. Um, and the simple principle for this tool is that we're going to compare how much raw material we buy and how much raw material goes to our customers in a useful form. And everything other than that, that difference between those two numbers, is going to be treated as waste until proved otherwise. If that number is large, then we break down, we find out actually where that material waste is going and we find out what we can do about it. If the number's small, we can look at another part of the process or a different material or apply a different tool or look at another industry entirely. So again, we're trying to do that valuation early on with minimal effort before doing too complex a, a data collection or analysis to see whether it's actually worth our time. And that's a key theme of the, the three tools in this toolkit. So we've applied this um, approach across a, a range of industries, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a, a few examples, saving the ones that are most relevant to, to construction for the end. Uh, so one of the first places we went was a steel um, products plant. So what these guys were doing, they were taking sheet steel and stamping shapes out of it and folding those up into products. Um, and what we that what they expected was that okay you know it's a natural part of this process that you waste about 20 percent of the sheet because you actually need to keep a a certain gap between parts um and we think we're pretty good at that so we estimate our our waste at about 20 percent 80 percent yield but actually if you compared how much steel they were buying to how much they were shipping out in the form of finished product their yield was 34 percent so part of that was, uh, so that's a big difference. And so that captured people's attention. It meant that it was worth going after and we did a bit of digging and we tried to find out where this, where this was going. Um, part of the uh, loss was the fact that they were building up a lot of raw material inventory, um, which given that this factory was operating at a thousand different product codes, uh, with a thousand different material codes, and those weren't necessarily a one-to-one -one map, there was a considerable risk of ending up with inventory that would then be wasted. It was no longer relevant or no longer um, applicable to the product mix that they were producing at any one time. In addition to that, you could break down the complexity of those thousand different product codes and thousand different material codes to your top five materials accounted for 77% of your loss. And your top five products on those materials accounted for a third of it. And that massively reduced the complexity in terms of how you were able to chase down the, the problems that were causing this, this loss without actually having to do a huge amount of chasing down analysis. So it's quite a simple process, but really helped this company take a step towards reducing its waste. Uh, another product that we looked at was a plastic uh, manufacturer. These guys were making coffee capsules. Um, so what you do is you stamp out a sort of cup and then you stamp out a lid and then you fill it with coffee to make it completely unrecyclable, wrap it in steel and send it to your customers, or in aluminium foil and send it to your customers. It's not exactly the world's most environmentally friendly product to start with. Um, but from a production point of view, these guys felt they were pretty good because 1% 
1.00%, which was a little bit suspicious, of their products were um, being rejected for being the wrong shape or the wrong size, according to a laser uh, measuring system. And, and that was their estimate of their, their losses. It was most of their losses or all of their losses were coming from this point, and it's about 1%. And so when you applied this in-out analysis over the course of a year, you found that your um, actual yield was 86%. In other words, you had 14 times the waste that you thought you did. Um, and so again, this was enough to spark an investigation. We looked into it. Uh, and what we found was that, um, well, a few things. Uh, one, this factory produced about 14 million capsules a year but it produced 16 million lids. Nobody knew why. And so the, the match between the uh, production and the, um, uh, of, of one line and the other capsule lid, uh, the capsule line and the lid line was mismatched. And so they were building up a stock of lids that they may or may not have been able to sell at the end of the production run. 60 tons of raw material was sitting in a warehouse um, and they changed supplier. They'd taken this material and, and decided that they weren't going to use it but it was still food grade material and so to just dump it in the recycling stream would be a huge downgrade and a huge write-off and so they didn't want to do that but it had then kind of got forgotten and they were paying warehouse space for it uh, and so again it uncovered the fact that there were these problems in their, um, their procurement and their inventory management just by doing this simple in-out analysis. So what relevance does this have to construction? Well, it is really clear that we're going to have to improve the material efficiency within construction if we're going to get anywhere near our net zero carbon targets. The construction phase uh, of building accounts for a large proportion of their life cycle GHG emissions. Uh, the exact proportion of that is uh, disputed depending on whether you're talking to the cement industry who like to minimize the embodied emissions and emphasize how good cement is for the thermal performance of the building uh, or if you're talking to the timber industry who like to kind of gloss over the thermal side of things uh, but show how good their construction products are compared to everybody else but it's certainly significant and our decarbonisation roadmaps that are being produced by um, people like the uh, Circular Economy Institute um, or even government roadmaps require a 20 to 50 percent reduction in emissions from reducing waste and inefficiency in order to meet our targets. But they're planning to meet a lot of these emissions post 2050. So in, as it stands, the construction industry is not going to hit its climate target without doing something about material efficiency. So that's the bad news. The good news slash the slightly terrifying but exciting opportunity is that in theory, could construction could reduce its environmental embodied CO2 emissions by order of magnitude 90% if it applied this zero loss approach and still deliver the design performance. What the customer is actually asking it to do, or perhaps more accurately, what the customer needs it to do, which is not always the same as what the customer asks for. Now, I don't want people to get too hung up on this number. This is coming out of some of the early work that I've been doing from the um, for the ACORN project, and it is a rough, rough estimate. It's pulling together some of the various estimates from industry as to what the different opportunities are at each stage of the um, construction process right from design to uh, demolition, uh, trying to separate them out into mutually exclusive opportunities and then figuring out what would happen if you did all of them. Um, and it also doesn't take into account you know, impact on the thermal performance. That's The jury is still very much out on that. But the two interesting things that I want you to take out of it are, one, there's a lot of opportunity out there. The construction industry can do a heck of a lot in order to reduce its embodied emissions, more than enough to meet its targets. And furthermore, there could be even more opportunity out there because one of the key points of this process that I'm really interested in is the on-site waste. You know, how much of material that gets delivered to a construction site actually ends up um, 
serving a useful purpose in the building or uh, structure that is being constructed. Um, now, the number that seems to be thrown around a lot of reports is 5%, which is not insignificant. That's what I've included in the, um, the graphic on the right. But I have certainly, from the anecdotal evidence that I've begun to hear as I've, I've started talking to people in construction, think that it might be more than that. And so I, I chased down what the original source of that number was. Um, with a little bit of help from Paul, uh, who's the one of the researchers from, from Bath, because actually the original paper was no longer available. Uh, he had to track it down for me in um, uh, it, on, on an archive because it was a student thesis from 1998. So at the very least, it's a number that could do with some updating. And that's where we're getting quite excited about the idea of applying zero loss yield analysis to the construction industry and see if we can get a better number than the one that's currently being used by RAP and quoted by a lot of roadmaps and reports. So we started doing this, uh, in fact, back when I was still working for CIS in the, in the Institute for Manufacturing. Um, and we started getting some projects, student projects, to look at uh, doing a zero loss analysis of um, precast construction. So more the um, off-site manufacturing, um, Jennifer and I agree that talking about uh, manufacturing is only happening off site is not helpful because we would like the construction industry to approach a more manufacturing type uh, situation, even on site. But we started with off site manufacturing. Um, and so the first of these we tried was with a concrete piles process, and 26% of the cement they bought did not reach its customers, at least in a useful form. So it may have been added to the mix and given away to the customers for free, uh, but according to the design elements for those precast uh, uh, piles and beams, it should not have been there. And so 26% of the cement was being wasted. This company had a goal to reduce its CO2 emissions by 10%. And they were willing to spend a lot of money on it. Just reducing or eliminating that waste would reduce their overall CO2 emissions by 23%, more than twice their goal. And it would save them money. So it, again, begins to tease out what the value of this type of approach is in different parts of the industry. Um, we did the same thing at a, another precast um, manufacturer. So this was making uh, a range of things like, you know, uh, spiral staircases and precast um, construction elements. And then they were also making tensioned steel beams. So uh, concrete poured over pre-tensioned steel wire. And these guys are no fools, right? We're not picking out uh, businesses that are doing particularly badly. In fact, the kind of people who want us poking around tend to already have been looking at their sustainability performance quite carefully. And these guys prior to us arriving had already taken a sort of sustainability by design approach, looked at what the um, requirements were of the pretension beams that they were um, manufacturing and realized that while they had five steel wires going through, they could actually get away with two and still deliver the performance that they were required to. So they cut their steel consumption by 60% just by asking that question before we even got on site. And yet, when you do that material bought to material delivered in a useful form comparison, you find that 14% of your cement and steel did not reach consumers. Now, this company was planning on spending about a million pounds to electrify its forklift fleet. And the graphic on the right shows you the improvement that they would get in terms of their carbon emissions from that compared to the amount of CO2 that they were wasting in the material that was not serving a useful purpose to them. In the cement alone, the savings were more than 10 times what they were planning to spend a million pounds on. So we're beginning to get some indications that even in the off-site manufacturing, which is theoretically thought to be more efficient than 
uh, pouring concrete on site, there is a lot of room for improvement that will both save money and save a lot of carbon. But how do we do this on site? And this is where I'd lead, I'd like to sort of lead a little bit into um, our, our discussion, which is we're going to have to change this approach in order to use it on a construction site. We're not looking at high volume products all made to a single design. We're making a single building, probably to a bespoke design or at least um, something that is you know, not being made in the dozens if you're looking at a housing estate or something rather than the thousands or even the millions. Um, estimating the design mass of concrete, you know, what is that uh, or materials, not just concrete, what material is serving a useful purpose in a structure is going to be more challenging to estimate, I think, than from a manufacturing process. Uh, how do you segregate a site to work out which deliveries are for which part of the of the structure? Um, and in an ideal world, we'd not be tra tracking concrete by mass, we'd be tracking the binder, particularly the cement, and seeing whether that is actually delivering the strength and a useful purpose all the way back. It'd be really interesting from those people who are more far more expert in construction than I am. And, and trust me, guys, the bar is pretty low when it comes to my uh, civil engineering expertise. Um, how we might address some of those challenges. Uh, and then we're going to use that to help us set a baseline for the ACORN project. So, uh, you know, I'm not the person in the room, but I, I, I saw Robin was here earlier to explain the ACORN project in detail, but in short, what they're planning to do is use robotic 3D printing to minimize material consumption by printing structures that are much more optimized to the load that they are going to bear. And, there is potential that having a um, robotic process means that you've got flexible but controlled manufacturing type approach, which may save more material still. And that's one of the things that I'll be trying to put a number on over the course of the next year. Um, and in order to do that, we need to do a like for like comparison with something serving a similar purpose. So perhaps a floor panel uh, manufactured by conventional processes, the latest and greatest off-site uh, manufactured floor panel and an ACORN floor panel. Do a zero loss analysis on each of these and see how, when you compare them to that perfect world, each of them stacks up. So I will wrap up there. Um, thank you very much for, for your attention. And I'd love to answer your questions. And I'd also really appreciate hearing suggestions or ideas about some of the challenges that we're going to face when applying this approach on the more messy world of a construction site. Thank you.